Ted Bundy, Theodore Robert Bundy, born with a name that sounds like a law firm, decided that life wasn't exciting enough. So, he embarked on a career path that involved kidnapping, raping, and murdering young women. You know, just your average 9 to 5 grind. Now, Teddy Boy wasn't just any psycho. No, no, he had a flair for the dramatic. Picture this, a handsome dude with a jawline that could cut glass, strolling up to unsuspecting ladies. He'd flash that winning smile, like a used car salesman peddling death. Hey there, miss, need help with that heavy bag? He'd say, all smooth and disarming. And bam, next thing you know, she's unconscious, handcuffed, and on her way to a one-way ticket to the afterlife. Teddy's M.O.? Oh, it was a masterpiece. He'd pretend to be injured, hobbling around like a wounded gazelle. The ladies, bless their hearts, would rush to his aid. Oh, poor thing, let me help you. They'd coo. And that's when Bundy would strike. But wait, there's more. Teddy loved souvenirs. Not the cheesy keychains you get at tourist traps, mind you. No, he collected severed heads. Yep, you heard it right. His apartment was like a macabre trophy room. Oh, this one. That's Becky. Lovely gal. Great taste in scarves. And let's not forget his prison escapes. Not one but two. It's like he was auditioning for America's Got Fugitives. He'd slip out, do a little sightseeing, maybe grab a latte, and then bam, back to his killing spree. Talk about work-life balance. In the end, justice caught up with our dashing sociopath. They zapped him in Florida, old Sparky style. But hey, at least he left a legacy, the Bundy effect. Every time a stranger offers to help you with your groceries, you side-eye them and think, is this my very own Ted Bundy? Ed Gein, the man who took home decor to a whole new level. You know, most people hang up family photos or maybe a tasteful landscape painting, but not our dear Ed. No, he preferred a more organic approach. Let's dive into the twisted tale of this Wisconsin weirdo. So picture this, Plainfield, Wisconsin, 1950s, a quaint little town where everyone knows everyone else's business. And then there's Ed Gein, quietly tending to his farm, probably humming, you are my sunshine. Innocent enough, right? Wrong. Ed had a thing for dead bodies, not in a, I'm a med student and need cadavers for my studies way. No, no. Ed was more like, hey, let's dig up some graves and make ourselves a nice lampshade. He'd raid local cemeteries and create charming household items like belts made of nipples. Yes, that's correct, nipple belts, perfect for any formal occasion. Ed wasn't content with just grave robbing. He decided to try his hand at murder. His first victim was Mary Hogan, a tavern owner. Apparently, Ed thought she'd look better as a lampshade. Then came Bernice Worden, the hardware store owner. Ed shot her and hung her upside down in his shed, like a particularly gruesome Christmas ornament. Now here's the kicker. This guy wasn't just any killer, he was a creative killer. He'd peel off skin to make masks, fashion skulls into soup bowls, and even whip up a snazzy vest made of human flesh. Talk about a DIY fan. His house was a horror show. Skulls on the mantelpiece, a human heart in a saucepan, and a face mask hanging from the doorknob. The authorities finally caught on, and Ed was deemed unfit to stand trial. They shipped him off to a mental health facility, where he probably gave the other patients decorating tips. In 1984, Ed shuffled off this mortal coil due to lung cancer. He now rests in an unmarked grave, presumably wearing a nipple belt. John Wayne Gacy. Born in Chicago in 1942, he was like any other kid, except for the fact that he had a penchant for dressing up as Pogo the Clown. Yes, you heard that right. The name alone should have raised some red flags. But hey, who doesn't love a good clown at a birthday party? Little did they know that behind that painted smile lurked a man with a crawl space full of secrets. Gacy's modus operandi was simple yet effective. He'd lure unsuspecting victims to his lair or suburban house under the guise of magic tricks. Hey kid, want to see a disappearing act? Just slip on these handcuffs and voila. And just like that, they'd vanish forever. His toolbox of horrors included rape, torture, and a dash of asphyxiation or strangulation with a garrote. Classy, right? He didn't stop at one or two murders. Oh no, Gacy was an overachiever. By the time he got caught in 1978, he'd racked up a body count of 33 young men and boys. That's like a whole baseball team plus a couple of substitutes. Impressive, in a morbid sort of way. The investigation began when a De Plains teenager named Robert Peist went missing. Turns out, Peist had an appointment with Gacy for a job interview. Well, he got the job all right, the job of being victim number 33. 
The police finally put two and two together, and Gacy's clown act came crashing down. He was sentenced to death in 1980 and executed by lethal injection in 1994. Carl Pansrum, born in 1891 to East Prussian immigrants in Minnesota, Carl was the black sheep in a family of seven children. His early life on the farm was no picnic. It was more like a boot camp with a side of child labor. The Pansram family's idea of family bonding involved chaining up the kids and working them to the bone. School, sure, but only after a night shift in the fields. Sleep was for the weak, apparently. By the ripe old age of 11, Carl was already a seasoned thief, having burglarized a neighbor's home. This little escapade earned him a ticket to the Minnesota State Training School, which was less of a school and more of a how-to-ruin-a-child's-life institution. The abuse he suffered there was the kind that would make a hardened criminal wince. It was here that Carl's hatred for authority and religion took root, fertilized by the cruelty of his overseers. As an adult, Carl's criminal curriculum vitae was impressively horrific. He wasn't just a serial killer, he was a one-man crime wave. He confessed to killing 21 people, but only five were confirmed. Because let's face it, Carl wasn't exactly the trustworthy type. He also claimed to have committed over a thousand acts of rape and a smorgasbord of other crimes. If there was a crime out there, Carl probably had it on his bucket list. Panzerm's philosophy was simple. He was not sorry. Not one bit. He saw society as his enemy, and he was at war with it until the very end. Harold Shipman, or Dr. Death, as he was not so affectionately known, was the kind of doctor you'd never want to book an appointment with. Born in Nottingham, England, on January 14, 1946, Shipman decided early on that the Hippocratic Oath was more of a suggestion than a rule. He was a general practitioner who took the caring for patients part of his job description and gave it a macabre twist. Shipman's career as a serial killer is like a dark comedy if you're into very, very dark humor. He started off as a respectable doctor, but somewhere along the line, he must have misread his job description. Instead of healing, he chose to deal death, prescribing lethal doses of diamorphine to his unsuspecting patients. With a victim count estimated at 250, he was nothing if not efficient. The man had a type, elderly and vulnerable, the kind of people who trusted their doctor implicitly. Shipman exploited this trust in the most heinous way possible, turning his medical practice into a conveyor belt of death. He even tried to inherit a tidy sum from one of his victims, because why stop at murder when you can add forgery to your list of hobbies? When he was finally caught, the trial was less about whether he did it and more about how many he managed to kill before getting caught. Sentenced to life imprisonment, Shipman hung up his stethoscope for good when he hanged himself in prison, just a day before his 58th birthday. Talk about timing. Jack the Ripper, the chap who was never caught and turned crime into a spectator sport in Victorian London. This guy was the elusive boogeyman of 1888, terrorizing the Whitechapel district by playing hide-and-seek with the police and leaving a trail of bodies that even Hansel and Gretel wouldn't envy. So, our dear Jack fancied himself a surgeon, or at least, that's what the state of his victims suggested. He had a particular penchant for women of the night, and not in the way you'd hope. Throats slashed, abdomens mutilated, organs missing. Jack's handiwork was nothing short of a nightmare, dressed like a medical exam. The media had a field day, of course. They even got fan mail from someone claiming to be Jack, including the charming From Hell letter that came with a side of human kidney. Talk about sending your regards. Despite the best efforts of the Bobbies on the beat and the armchair detectives of the day, Jack's identity remained as murky as a London fog. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, smash that subscribe button like it's a piñata, and let's hit those numbers like we're breaking a world record.